Well, you know how it is with spies. Your own spies are intrepid heroes and the other guy's spies are to be put to death like some kind of child murderer. That's just the way it is with spies. We're going to look at the execution of a British spy by the Americans in the American War of Independence. A sad story. Hiya, welcome back to my little channel, my little hobby channel, where I talk about stuff of interest to me that might be of interest to you. Um, if it's your first time here, welcome. If you're one of my 300 or so subscribers, well, welcome back, thanks. Now, the American War of Independence, or the, uh, the Revolutionary War, or the American Revolution, or the Colonial War, as different people might call it. Um, I never thought the word revolution was right for that, same as uh, I've heard it recently used about the Irish War of Independence, the Irish Revolution, the American Revolution. To me, a revolution is more like Russia or France, where there's actually a revolution, as the term suggests, like a wheel, where the bottom go to the top and the top go to the bottom. If you're just lopping off the top layer of foreign dominance, I don't know if it's really a revolution. Um, War of Independence seems to make more sense as a title. Although Al Pacino did star in a movie called Revolution that everybody has forgotten about. Um, it's been written out of history. Uh, I actually watched it a couple of years ago and I can remember nothing about it. Um, I think it was even filmed in England rather than America. Right, um, the American War of Independence was 13 colonies on the east coast of North America rejecting British rule. Um, it wasn't America as we know it now, um, for those who don't know. It was, uh, it was the initial area that Britain had colonized and um, America then expanded later through purchase and through conquest and a little bit of subterfuge maybe. Um, the, basically the 13 colonies had a lot of tension with Britain and finally they laid down their demands to the British which the British rejected and so the Americans formed the Continental Army and uh, one of the first things they did was they invaded Canada and there they captured a soldier called John Andre. Now, Andre was uh, born in London of Huguenot parents. Uh, well brought up, went to uh, an elite school, St. Paul's, which was then in the grounds of St. Paul's Cathedral, and um, was heading towards a career probably in, um, in trade. He fell in love with a woman called Honora Snade, and um, they had quite an attachment. He was quite taken with her and they became engaged. Both families were against the match. They weren't allowed to marry. And she went off and got married later. And he went and joined the army. She married a guy called Richard Edgeworth. And Edgeworth's townhouse in County Longford in Ireland is where he was, uh, his base. Um, he was an inventor, an interesting guy. Uh, had four different wives. Um, and Orla Snade was one of them. They were all quite progressive. They were big into writing and literature and women's education, which um, would have been frowned upon at the time by, uh, by the general society. General society at the time probably had a bit more in common with the Taliban than ourselves when it came to, came to women. Honora Snade eventually died of tuberculosis. Edgeworth married her sister afterwards. Um, Andre apparently never got over the thing and was, had carried a, a locket with her picture ever since, um, they say. So he joined the army, went to North America. Uh, he had been, a, it was the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, I think he was who he joined, but he uh, got into intelligence because he was quite smart, quite a smart guy. When he was in uh, Fort St. John in Canada, that's when the Americans invaded uh, Quebec, laid siege to this fort, and he was taken prisoner along with the garrison. They were held, taken back to America and held under uh, parole. By the way, the major, the, the, the senior officer of the American side 
who led that campaign and captured that fort, he also had connections. He was a Ulster Scots Presbyterian kind of guy, but their family home was Abbeville in North Dublin, who uh, some of you will, will recognise the term, the name, as uh, being connected with one of our more notorious politicians. He later bought that house, Abbeville. But anyway, this guy had uh, been in the British Army and settled, retired into America. And when the Continental Army was formed, he, he fought for the Americans and, and led that, that raid into Canada, that, that invasion of Canada. So Andre was being held uh, on parole, which meant he wasn't a prisoner. He was basically free to come and go. He was uh, entertained and entertaining and much liked. He, he was the kind of guy who would write verse and write comic verse and popular guy and smart guy. So he was then eventually exchanged in a prisoner exchange and returned to Philadelphia where he carried on being quite popular. And in Philadelphia, one of the people he used to visit was the, um, the Shippen family, um, family of merchants, and their daughter, Peggy Shippen, um, befriended him. She was 15 or 16 at the time. And uh, he formed quite an attachment with her and after he left, after the British pulled out of Philadelphia, they kept in touch uh, and she went on to marry a fella called Benedict Arnold, who Americans would probably know. If you're not American, you might have heard the name referred to in American movies or on TV. He's the go-to example of a traitor uh, in America. You know, Benedict Arnold is known for being a traitor. And when... Peggy Shippen was getting married to him. He was, at the time, an important man in the Continental Army, but even then he was being investigated for corruption. So he was a dodgy character all the time, I'd say. He became the commander of the fort at West Point on the Hudson River, which was a, a key position. Now, Andre had become the head of British intelligence by this stage in North America. Major Andre. And he had kept up his correspondence with Peggy Shippen, now the wife of Benedict Arnold. And with her as a go-between, Arnold was negotiating to hand over the fort to the British. So uh, HMS Vulture, a sloop, went up the Hudson River carrying Andre. They were going to have this uh, a meeting and nail down the uh, the way it was going to be done. He was, uh, Arnold was running down the defences of the fort deliberately and was set, setting it up for loss or handover to the British. Benedict Arnold convinced a couple of guys to row out to the sloop, the vulture, and take Andre ashore. They, he convinced them. They were reluctant. He almost uh, threatened to arrest them when they refused, but he was convincing them that they were doing the right thing by America that he had some plan that, and they were to play their part by collecting Andre from the vulture and bring him ashore which they did they were having a meeting on shore they were going through plans of the the fort that Arnold was handing over to Andre around about this time some of the Americans copped that the vulture was in the river and they rounded up a couple of cannon and started bombarding the vulture so she had to withdraw and that left Andre kind of stranded. So there he was on the banks of the Hudson, unable to get back to the sloop. They arranged to get him a horse and he changed into civilian clothes and he stuffed the plans of the fort inside his stocking down in his boot. And he decided to make his way out overland. He'd been given a pass by Benedict Arnold that would get him through the lines. Now, the next day, as he was riding, he encountered three men who stopped him. And one of them was wearing uh, an overcoat that was belonging to one of the Hessian regiments that were attached to the British Army. These were German, German units that were working with the British Army at the time. When he encountered these men, he asked them, were they Tories? Were they, were they loyalists? That was the phrase. Tories was one of the terms used for the American loyalists who were loyal to the British regime at the time. And they said they were, and he announced himself as a British officer. But then they revealed themselves to be Americans involved with the loyal to the Continental Army. And he tried to change his tune and say, look, he was on a mission for 
Benedict Arnold and he had a pass that would get him through but they were very suspicious and they took him to an officer at this stage uh, well there has been suggestions that maybe they were actually they weren't really stalwart militiamen they were actually chancers looking to see what they could rob from the army but um, and they, they were trying to rob Andre as he came through Andre claimed in his trial that that's what they were trying to do when they were searching him anyway they brought Andre to an officer and he went through the stuff and he realised what was going on he was on the point of sending him to Benedict Arnold to be dealt with which would have been handy for him but a, a superior officer realised that Arnold was involved and decided not to but somebody did send a note to Benedict Arnold letting him know that Andre had been captured and that his name was involved. Washington arrived on the scene and it, by that stage Arnold was gone. He'd made his way to the vulture and was gone. So Andre was in a bit of a pickle. Now we'll just look at spying and how, how that stands in the law as such or the, the customs of war. There wasn't really a code of practice for what was allowed or not allowed in war. The first of that, the first time something like that happened was what they called the Lieber Code. And Lieber was a, a Prussian guy, German, born Berlin. Um, uh, he had been uh, very interested in politics and history and uh, took, an, took an active stance against the Prussian aristocracy. Uh, went to Greece for a bit, um, got involved in sort of revolutionary stuff there. When things got too awkward for him in Europe, he went to the UK and was very involved in the whole health and fitness stuff and um, which was just kicking off then the idea of gymnasiums and and swimming was, it was a big thing for him as well and then he got a, an offer to run a gymnasium in boston i think it was so he went to the us and um, in boston the the novelty of the gym wore off so which is the way with gyms and uh, he moved on from that to becoming a lecturer in political science um, politics and history that kind of thing he was uh, one of the first people to actually treat that as a special subject and uh, he was quite well regarded and he wrote this Libra code which basically tried to codify the practices that had become accepted over time in, in warfare and during the American Civil War um, he was talking to the politicians and Lincoln in particular was interested in the idea of introducing a uh, proper rules for how people should behave in war spurred on by the fact that the confederates had decided they were just going to shoot black prisoners taken in the union army and they were just going to regard them as criminals and kill them um, as a counter to that into the union army lincoln introduced this general order 100 or something i forget what it was called but it was basically the Lieber code institutionalized in the american army and when internationally the countries looked at putting together some kind of international rules and the Hague conventions started at the end of the uh, 19th century it was effectively the Libra code that they based that on and then they refined them as the Hague conventions went on but their attitude to spying was that it was kind of funny um, and I guess it, 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 if it was in this code, it must have been what was in practice beforehand. Um, if you were caught spying, if you were in uniform, your own uniform, and you were behind enemy lines, that was okay. But if you were employing any kind of subterfuge, dressing as a civilian or dressing in the enemy's uniform, then you were beyond the rules of war. You could not be regarded as a prisoner of war what you were doing had, was beyond the bounds of what was acceptable for a, a combatant and so you were then subject to the rules of the country that had captured you if you were being sneaky basically because the code and the rules said that if you were identified as a spy but not captured and then subsequently captured in uniform in the normal course of events you could not be retrospectively punished for having been a spy earlier it was only if you were caught funny kind of situation it's only if you were caught 
in the act would you be regarded as a spy so it's odd but that was the rules basically if you were a spy you could have expect to be executed because that's what everybody regarded as the, the appropriate punishment so Andre was in this pickle he uh, he asked what was going to happen to him and he was basically told look the British have executed Nathan Hale who was an American gathering information behind the lines they executed him you're going to be executed but everybody he was widely known and widely liked and everybody was kind of um, quite sympathetic to the, the situation he found himself in he was claiming look he didn't intend to be out of uniform and be spying it was just the way it unfolded and uh, there was a suggestion the the Americans were very pissed off obviously with um, Benedict Arnold and they thought everybody might benefit if they were able to swap they would release Major Andre to the British in exchange for getting Benedict Arnold back whom they could punish uh, the British much as they wanted to get their very popular Major John Andre back they declined Washington was appealed to um, he couldn't re he, he wasn't going to bend the rules um, and Andre did write to him after he was tried and sentenced to be executed sentenced to be hanged Andre did appeal to be shot as an officer as a gentleman but uh, Washington uh, didn't budge on that either the whole thing about like the, the execution of spies carried on right up like in both world wars everybody was enthusiastically executing spies um, in World War Two, for example, there were spies, German spies, ended up in America. Um, they had never really intended, apparently, to do a whole lot, but they were sent, and their leader, if I remember rightly, their, lead, their leader turned them in, and he was given a, a jail sentence, and all the others were electrocuted uh, secretly. There were German spies landed in Britain. Now, Britain turned a lot of spies, the famous Operation Double Cross. But there was one group of Belgian and Dutch that landed, uh, and they, I think, were. Did they turn themselves in or were they caught? But they were tried, and uh, unfortunately, they were, they were given legal advice to, um, to plead guilty and appeal to the mercy of the court. But once they pled, pled guilty, they could not be heard. They were not heard. Basically, plead guilty bang there's the sentence and one of those guys when he was writing his final letters to his family and stuff his jailers realized that uh, that he'd been forced into it that his family were being held by the by the Gestapo and that he had been forced into into doing this and uh, they had appealed but to their up, higher ups say look this guy isn't as bad as all that but uh, no executed they were all hung that group apart from one man who had been in I think the Belgian military at one point so therefore he was allowed to be shot so in the Tower of London the others were hung he was taken to the Tower of London's uh, shooting range and uh, executed by firing squad so there was uh, there was a lot of killing of spies going on in the, in the Second World War the, the because the Germans and the Russians and the Japanese took executions to the, the next level and were killing people uh, at the drop of a hat as a spy. But after World War Two, I think the rules were changed. I can't I don't have the details on that. You can look it up for yourself. So Major John Andre was going to be hanged, not shot. When the time came for his execution, apparently there was a there was a pall of gloom over the proceedings because everybody was extremely sympathetic to him. Um, he breakfasted that morning and uh, his servant was very upset and he chided his servant to uh, to go away and come back when he was being a bit more manly and uh, he was he told his Americans that he was ready and they, they brought him out to execute him and he balked a little when he saw the uh, the gallows and gathered himself and, and carried on and he was uh, he was being placed in a cart under a noose and he climbed onto the cart put his own blindfold on and uh, and put the noose on his own neck uh, they asked him had he any final words and he li lifted the uh, the handkerchief that he had around his eyes 
and he asked would they uh, bear witness to the fact that he went to his death as a brave man. They hung him, they pulled the wagon out, he, he died and they buried him in uniform at the spot where he died at the gallows. There is a story that as he went to the gallows a local woman offered him a peach and the peach whether he ate it or, or not or had it in his pocket but allegedly the peach tree a peach tree grew on the spot from the peach that the woman had given him from the stone and it is suggested that when later on um, his body was moved from there he uh, they had to cut cut hack away at the roots of the peach tree that was growing through his ribs to to get his body out but his body was taken back to Britain in the later years uh, shipped back and uh, interred in Westminster Abbey where he rests to this day and you can go and see it I wonder how he'd have felt if he'd known that 250 years later people would still be talking about him would that have made him feel any better going to the scaffold so that is the sad story of Major Andre little life hack for you there's a, a woman had a flat tire on Christmas Day she pulled over in our gateway I couldn't, I couldn't get the lug nuts undone and uh, obviously you need an extension on your wheel brace if the lug nuts are stiff they've been obviously put on with some kind of machine so what I'm doing is uh, I'm using the jack to free up the lug, the lug nuts I remember once at a funeral, um, badly stuck, needed to get uh, a wheel changed and uh, had one nut that would not come undone. So I was able to put the wheel brace on the lug nut in such a, such a way that it was in touch with the ground. And then as we drove forward a couple of inches, that gave the, the necessary force to undo that one nut that we couldn't do by hand. It'll save you some day. I hope you got something from that now. I hope you found that interesting. Bye now. Mind yourselves.